Welcome to Ask Coffee Online here live at 9.30 with Chef Thomas. We have a fantastic topic today. A lot of students are always asking for some information about this modernist cuisine uh, topic. It's definitely not a fad. It's definitely something to stay. Uh, we basically just now use technology in a different way to help us chefs to really um, show food in different ways. So today is actually a basics class, kind of like a fundamentals or an introduction to modernist cuisine. And uh, for that reason, we're going to actually take it kind of slow. Uh, we're going to actually talk about all the different steps. We talk about the chemicals, uh, we talk about the equipment, and uh, some of the terminology you might actually run into. I want to tell you right from the beginning that uh, modernist cuisine has different, different facets. So it's also heavily influenced by the chef itself, uh, what their training is and what they actually um, assume to be modernist cuisine. That could be very well that a uh, chef maybe from the uh, Western training, like the classical French cuisine, sees certain things more as a modernist technique than maybe a chef from uh, Asia. We can also think uh, in terms of skill levels. So maybe for you, making a pancake mix is a very low level um, recipe, but maybe for somebody who has never made a pancake mix, uh, that might be actually a chemical reaction there happening he has no idea of, off and maybe even screws that up. So, to understand what we're really doing here, we're going to go step by step. And the first thing is, we're going to talk about the science or if it's actually cooking. So, when you look at typical pictures of um, molecular gastronomy and modernist cuisine, this is always showing some weird forms, textures, or um, foams, or little pebbles that look like caviar in different colors. So uh, in, in, in layman's terms, it seems like it's all science. Uh, but it is actually very simple uh, cooking. Why is it simple cooking? Because the chemicals we use have not really changed. i give you a good example here. Um, xanthan gum, which is used to change velocity in uh, dressings, is actually derived by a sugar fermentation by an uh, enzyme found in a cabbage. So this is not something we manufacture. This is actually something which is naturally um, available to us. If you think about baking soda or cornstarch or actually sugar itself, all these ingredients are in the, in the most basic form a chemical. So we refined sugar beets or cane sugar. We wash it. We, we, we bleach it, we dry it, uh, we crystallize it, and we get sugar out of it. So there's really nothing, really nothing uh, not uh, produced here. This, the sugar is actually a, a washed out uh, product from a, root, a beetroot. So um, thinking about all these different ingredients we have, we work with already, you work on the level of molecular gastronomy. You already work on the level of modernist cuisine. It is just not really pointed out to you. So going back to my pancake mix, think about that. Pancake mix. All you add is usually water, right? But you have a chemical reaction with that powder. It leavens it. It brings air bubbles in it. It actually combines it. It builds gluten. It compacts it. And you can actually make it into pancakes with um, actually obviously also adhering fire to it in a saute pan or on a griddle or so forth. So think about this. All these, diff these technical uh, terms you might hear now are very basic cooking techniques too. So let's go for some of the um, chemicals we find in a typical kit for a modernist or molecular uh, gastronomy. Uh, this actually is one of the kits I got just from the internet. Uh, we have very different packages here. This is a starter kit. It comes with absolutely everything. You have a scale in there, but we're going to go for the equipment in a second. Uh, let's go first for the chemicals here. There's your xanthan gum. Uh, there's some um, those like uh, sodium alginate, agar agar is in there, sorbates, uh, lactate acid, and so forth. Uh, lactic acid is something which you can find in milk. So all these chemicals you see in here are actually derived of um, most of the natural uh, ingredients. So we're talking about milk, possibly malt. We're talking about sugar, corn starches, and so forth, other vegetables and fruits. So don't be afraid playing with these chemicals because technically 
that's all you do when you cook. You work with chemicals and with chemical and physical reactions of these. Uh, leveling agents in baking is, a, is one of the best examples I can think of right now. Again, talked a little bit about how sugar is produced. Um, even cornstarch is majorly manufactured. So don't be afraid of buying one of these kits uh, online and just trying uh, to make some of these recipes. I'm pretty sure everybody of you has made jello in their life already. There's nothing else. It's a chemical reaction um, of uh, the dispersion of water in a different um, material. So, so these were your chemicals. So don't be afraid of uh, getting one of these kits and actually playing around with it because the chemicals are not really dangerous. Um, let's go a little bit to the equipment. Modernist cuisine has a vast array of different techniques. But one of the biggest techniques you see, so, um, you see modernist cuisine chefs uh, employ is actually sous vide cooking. Sous vide cooking is actually very, very simple to do. Um, but here's one of the machines. <coughs> and uh, this sous vide machine does nothing else than actually uh, cook water to a particular temperature and uh, for a particular time. So it has a timer on here and uh, water temperature. Why is this so important for sous vide cooking? I can do anything in here. I can do, uh, I can do basically start a braising technique. I could start here a beautiful uh, grilled steak technique. I could start poaching eggs in here. I could start a hollandaise sauce. There's so many different techniques I can start with this sous vide machine by just employing two principles, time and temperature, which is always very important. And we have a question. What is the typical shelf life of those chemicals? That is a very good question, and I will have to get back to you. But because they're chemicals and they're tight sealed, I would probably say you have more than six months for sure on these chemicals. I don't see any expiration date when I tried them out uh, yesterday. so. Probably longer than that, but I can get back to you on that one. Um, good. So sous vide machine. For the sous vide machine technique, uh, because it's submerged in water, we also need to make sure that our product is sealed in. For the sealing, we have different techniques, but one of them is a, um, a vacuum sealer. This vacuum sealer is very basic. You need a bag. You put the bag into the vacuum sealer and uh, you seal it shut. It takes all the air out. This is also called an atmospheric uh, packaging system. So for those of you who are very into food science and into uh, studying bacteria, there is anaerobic uh, bacteria which can grow in materials or in, in products which have been uh, exhausted of air. So we want to make sure that we don't use this or overuse this too much. But for the fact of sous vide, all I have to do is put it in a sous vide bag, take the air out, and seal it. The reason why I put the air out is very simple. If I would have a bag with air in it, it would actually not cook evenly in a sous vide machine because it would swim on top of the water and not uh, disper uh, dis dispersed in the, in the water. How can I do this differently if I don't want to buy one of these uh, sealants? Very simple. Um, water um, pushes air out, so if I have the product in a Ziploc bag and I just put it into the water, the air actually gets um, pushed out. I can seal it on the very top. No water goes in, but I actually have an a airtight uh, a bag then with the product in it. So again, I don't have to buy this. I can do a Ziploc bag just as much. Don't wrap anything up in plastic wrap. That would not work because the water will eventually make its way into the plastic wrap. Uh, obviously not paper bags either. So here you go, Ziploc bags it is. <coughs> Modernist cuisine is also going back a couple years into techniques we have used for, for, for many, many years in, in old uh, soda houses and, and soda shops. Um, some of you actually might know this from uh, going and getting a, a ice cream soda at a soda place. These are siphons. These siphons work with uh, gas, which we put here in a cartridge, and we uh, close it and actually disperse into the um, container here and aerates the, the, the product when it comes out when I actually pull the trigger. Uh, this is done for something as simple as soda or also for creams like whipped creams. So in this particular technique here now in modernist cuisine, 
a lot of chefs have put a lot more thought to it. We actually can now make in combination of a sous vide machine and the siphon hollandaise sauce pretty much completely fresh and creamy right off the siphon uh, to order, which is, was something we had to hand whip uh, on the line for steaks and for, uh, uh, for other dishes like, um, um, you know, maybe hollandaise for asparagus or um, for breakfast dishes. So the siphon actually works really well. Now be very careful. I would always tell you to get a metal based siphon because these are actually the ones you can keep warm. Uh, plastic one I would be a little bit careful. Um, and they obviously usually also deal so well with high pressure. So make sure you get a nice metal one. Uh, stainless steel is easy to clean. Uh, and there's two different gases you can use. One is for soda and one is for more of the cream, um, the heavy cream, the cream desserts. So there's two different gases. You can even get this very simple online. Uh, I think I got that one actually from uh, Amazon.com for us. So uh, there's different attachments too. Um, there's an also attachment to fill your donuts if you're into baking and pastry. All right. Another equipment we have, which is very common, I actually have two of them, are a blender or as we can also call this, like kind of a more a bar blender we call this, right? Because we have the container with the blade in here. Uh, we can pour it out easy. Or a stick blender. Uh, in the culinary terms, we call this an, uh, uh, an out, 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 outboat motor too, because we like to like play around with these big ones. Yeah, a stick blender, uh, emulsifier. Um, these are very, very important tools anyways for your culinary a career. Um, very helpful to make sauces and soups of any kind. Uh, very nice to aerate. Uh, also uh, for um, any other liquids, even in the bar possibly. So if you make like mixed drinks, this would come really in handy. So one of these would be probably a good idea if you want to start out your equipment shopping for your uh, modernist cuisine. These are actually nice because I can actually take the stick off and then wash this because obviously the motor should not get wet. All right, and we have one more item left. <clears throat> a blowtorch. Blowtorches in modernist cuisine do a couple things. Obviously they can uh, brulee items like you probably know from baking and pastry for the creme brulee. Um, but you can also uh, ap apply this technique to uh, meats. Uh, for food photography, a very good idea to have a blowtorch to actually focusing in on, um, on the areas of uh, caramelizing some of the protein. So a blowtorch is a very nice tool to have. It uh, does a lot of different things for us uh, on the dessert as well also on the uh, hot food side. So that would be definitely a nice thing. These are, this is a culinary one. It would be as simple as going to a, um, to a like a, a tool shop and actually picking up the propane tanks there with the attachment. You have a little bit more gas. Obviously, they look a little bit more clunky. So that is it pretty much on the larger equipment. Now we're going to look at the small one. Very, very important for molecular gastronomy is a gram scale. This is a gram scale. Um, this is very, very important to have because most not most, all the recipes in molecular gastronomy are in milligrams and milliliters. The fun part about the metric system is that 100 milliliters are exactly the same as 100 milligrams. So it's very easy to do ratios and most of your recipes are built in ratios. So if I have 100 grams of a liquid and I need 0.02% of um, maybe agar agar, there will be only two milligrams of this particular product. So it's very easy to do ratios with, a, uh, with the metric system and with the correct measurement. Now, to measure small items, we have also small uh, plastic containers. They weigh very, very little, so it's very easy to tar them out and then add the powders to it and the chemicals. So there's a couple, there's like actually four in here. So that actually came with that kit. So again, Milligram scale, I think you call them also a postage uh, uh, scale here in America. Uh, we have another question. How does the blowtorch, uh, what does the blowtorch run on? Gas, electricity, pencil cells? Oh, uh, the question was how the um, 
um, the blowtorch works. It's actually, this one is actually gas you use for uh, lighters. So you can f get these refill um, cartridges for the gas uh, for, you can see this right here. Uh, you can actually push that container right in here and it fills it up back with that uh, gas and uh, then you can use it. It's it basically lighter, what would you call it, lighter fluid gas? Yeah, lighter fluid gas, that's what it is. Um, electricity, I haven't seen. I've seen smoke guns. These are, they look very similar to this, but they're small and you use them for smoking small things like hors d'oeuvres. Uh, they use sometimes on electricity, but other than that, it's, um, it's uh, gas. So, but good question, thank you so much. All right, so back to our scale. Uh, that scale runs not on gas, it runs on batteries. I can tell you that for sure. Um, so a gram scale, or I'm pretty sure I looked it up, it's called a postage, postage or mail um, scale here in America. They go really, really low with the grams. All right, another cool equipment items, the small ones, is um, this looks kind of really fancy. This is actually a slotted spoon, uh, a, a perforated spoon. Uh, we get a lot of the full caviar, uh, any of the spherifications out of the uh, liquids and then we can wash them off very easy. So you need that to basically fish out your uh, molecular gastronomy uh, spheres or caviar or maybe even a spaghetti noodle uh, from a tomato juice so forth. Uh, syringes, I'm not a doctor but syringes are actually really easy to get. Uh, to get. You can actually go to any of your drugstores and get a couple from there. Uh, also with the syringes I would tell you to also get some plastic uh, hoses if you want to make uh, noodles and stuff like that. That is actually really cool and then they obviously should fit right on the syringe top. Uh, sizes do not matter, it really depends what you want to do. These are also possible uh, to use for making the full caviar. Um, it kind of takes a while to drop them all in very slowly but this is actually basically the same technique. So spoons or sieves and uh, syringes, very important. All right, so we went for all our uh, ingredients and, or chemicals, sorry, and our equipment. Now let's talk a little bit about the different terminology. And I got all my knowledge through reading. So I have two books I want to refer you to. Uh, one is called Modernist Cooking Made Easy. This actually came with the kit I purchased and uh, it was very, very reasonable. And when I say very reasonable, I tell you right there, it was under $100. And there's a lot of material in there to actually be made. Everything in the kit um, is uh, supporting everything in this book. So there's nothing else you have to buy. You don't have to buy the sous vide machine for this book. You don't have to buy anything else. The book and the chemicals is perfectly fine. Then you get all the small equipment I just showed you. So this is a really, really nice book. Another book I have uh, which was a little bit more costly, is the Modernist Cuisine. Modernist Cuisine is introducing all aspects of uh, modern techniques. So we're talking about the sous vide machine, we're talking about emulsifications, we're talking about changes of textures and flavors, uh, the correct application of heating methods to eggs, to meat and so forth. So this is a fantastic uh, read for chefs. This actually comes in a collection of five books for the professional and uh, runs anywhere between, I think I saw it the cheapest at $500 online right now. This alone I got at the bookstore for 119 So this is definitely costly, but the pictures in it, the explanations, the recipes, uh, it comes with a kitchen manual actually, so you don't have to schlep this big book around. Uh, it's fantastic. If you really want to get into that, these are the two things I would definitely stress highly for you to get. Uh, there is no cookbook out there which really explains that unless you go directly for modernist cuisine uh, or the modernist cooking made easy. <clears throat> and let me tell you I know what I'm talking about because I'm researching this for a long time. All right, so I learned four ter terms to really uh, look for when I read these recipes. One was called dispersion, uh, the other one was hydration. We have viscosity and then ratio. Ratio I already explained a little bit. Ratio is basically if I take 100% um, of a liquid and I want to get a chemical reaction to it and need a 0.05 ratio to it, a percent. I can ratio that up because of the easiness of the grams and um, the milligrams. So 
Uh, ratio is very easy to understand. You just have to probably read it a couple times and you will get it right away. Uh, viscosity is a fantastic word. I've practiced this word for a while now, <laughs> viscosity. Viscosity means nothing else than changing a liquid's flow. Uh, meaning water runs right out of a glass, right? That has a uh, high velocity. So it's very fl fluid, it's very, uh, it's quick. Uh, maple syrup, especially when it comes out of a fridge, has a low viscosity. It's very slow and uh, it's, it's gooey. And um, so these different techniques uh, or these different uh, textures are very important for us to understand. So how can I change water into the viscosity of maple syrup? How can I change a Kool-Aid into the viscosity of um, a vinaigrette? So with this in mind, here are the first couple steps you have to take in looking at products and thinking, wow, how can I change this so the mouthfeel is different, the texture. Remember we did a, a while ago a class uh, <coughs> on, um, on the flavor wheel and we talked about mouthfeel and textures. So modernist cuisine does a lot of that and wants to employ all these different um, mouthfeels and textures to the food so we can change um, components around. Uh, would be really cool to have uh, spicy ice or it would be maybe cool to make a tomato sauce into a spaghetti noodle. So these are the things you really have to think about because that is what modernist cuisine chefs do. This is what they look at when they uh, determine uh, maybe a new dish. Um, dispersion is an interesting thing. Is how much water do I need to make uh, this, these changes? Flour. If I trust make uh, flour and I mix it into water, it will clump up. The dispersion is not very easy for flour and water. But as soon as I heat up the water, um, and I put the flour in, I need heat and it actually works out well and, and it will thicken also. Now hydration on the other hand is something how the product takes water in. Um, let's stick with flour. Uh, if you have made a roux which is equal parts fat and flour cooked together for a thickening agent but you actually add milk, you actually see how the product first gets very liquid and expands and then it starts really thickening up because all the gluten take all that water up and it hydrates. Uh, there's other <clears throat> uh, ingredients that also hydrate. Technically think about that anything that's dry will take water on, right? So think about that. How cool would it be to make like an oil powder and make that hydrate with, with a liquid to give it a different flavor? So think about these things. All of that is possible with modernist cuisine and with a little bit of molecular um, techniques. Um, now go back a little bit more into very basic things. So when I make a plate here, I want to look for following things. Why do I employ this molecular and this modernist cuisine? I want to change. I want to change the main product. I want to change size. Uh, I want to make maybe a big piece of protein into a small piece of protein, but I want to have the same texture, I want to have the same powerful flavor. Maybe I want to take a big tomato and I want to put it in a small leathery texture and roll it up and make sure that it really bursts of flavor of tomato. So I want to say change size. I want to change texture. So we're changing size and texture. Texture, I want to have something which used to be uh, high velocity to low velocity. I want something which was like honey. I want to be able to drink it. I want to be able to chew on a vodka. I don't want to drink the vodka, I want to chew the vodka. So there's different things how to think about texture. And then the final step for a lot of chefs is that I want to use an ingredient in a different matter than it is actually uh, used before. Think about mirepoix. You all know what that is. You have your carrots, your onions, and your celery. What is if I can make mirepoix into gel? How can I cut it up? Can I put it into a salad and make that mirepoix still taste like mirepoix, but now it's maybe gelatinized, maybe it has a different form and shape? Uh, how about fruit juices? Can I do that for maybe drinks in a bar? So these are the things. Um, why am I actually doing molecular gastronomy? Why am I doing modernist cuisine? So uh, a couple basic things which we're going to go in a couple more classes is uh, really simple stuff, thickening, a huge huge step towards um, a better way of life is actually thickening with molecular gastronomy and modernist cuisine in mind. We want to get away from using gluten, right? So um, how about 
um, less thickening agents? How about not employing any heat to the product? How about speeding the process up of thickening? Um, how about consistently not changing the flavor of something thickened? So these are the things where modernist cuisine chefs also look for these uh, changes in cooking techniques and to employ modernist cuisine to thickening agents. How about sauces and vinaigrettes? How many times did an emulsion not work out for you? Oil and water does not like to mix. What is if I tell you then in upcoming classes, I can show you how the vinaigrettes, they do not break apart. Um, and I don't need to use a stick blend of every five minutes. Uh, how about I tell you that I can reduce the fat in a vinaigrette? You're going to be like, how is that going to work? Vinaigrette is two parts oil and one part vinegar, right? So, but that works. We can change these vinaigrettes and these sauces to make them fat reduced. We can change the body and the texture of these vinaigrettes and sauces. And most importantly, we can keep the original flavor of the sauce and the vinaigrette and maybe even intensify it by not adding so many other thickening agents we are used to. Last but not least, I, sh I brought a couple pictures here. Um, how this actually looks in entertainment. So we are doing these um, fantastic ideas, um, but how does it actually look like? So maybe you do an hors d'oeuvre party. Maybe you make a salad. Um, this salad maybe looks, you know, it's served on a spoon. Um, maybe you serve a strawberry soup uh, in, a, in a sphere. Uh, maybe you are uh, going through uh, some of your ideas for uh, an entree dish. Or you actually put these um, molecular gastronomy items into your drink and you mix it up there, like a full caviar. So in closing, or to summarize uh, what we talked about today, don't be afraid of looking at modernist cuisine. Don't be afraid to use chemicals you have never worked with. Learn a new technique. Uh, learn to think in grams, in milligrams. Think in ratios, which some of you in baking pastry already do anyways. It's very similar, or actually the same as baker's percentages. And uh, get equipment, start buying some kits to, to, to play around with. Um, and you will see how quickly <coughs> your plate presentation changes, your dinner parties are gonna change, uh, who knows, maybe you're going to start making your own gummy bears and uh, your own Twizzlers pretty soon. This is all part of molecular gastronomy. It's all part of this big trend of modernist cuisine. Check it out. Go into your restaurants. See what they're doing. <clears throat> and maybe soon you will find something like I made yesterday, which is a pineapple gel, which... I can cut and fold however I want. I could use this for drinks. I could use this on a salad. But as I can tell you here right now, this is definitely a pineapple you've never had before. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, if you have any other questions, please make sure you email me. I will put the two titles of the books on the web in a couple minutes. And thank you so much, and I'll see you soon again.